Good morning, everyone. Uh, how's everyone doing? Right, uh, my name is Taha. I'm an I'm a incoming senior at Apoquinimic High School in Middletown. And today I'm here to talk about my Muslim role model. And that, that is the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad. The man most closely associated with the religion of Islam. A man of strength, virtue, character, faith, and loyalty. The Prophet's impact can still be felt today, and it will continue, be, continue to be felt generations from now. This man represents over a billion people and binds those billion people to their faith, their beliefs, their religion, and most importantly, their God. Muhammad was more than just an Arab man. He was a, divine, he was a spiritual link between the divine and the human. But what was it that made Muhammad so appealing to his people, his family, and most importantly, his God? The answer is quite simple. He was a man of his word, he didn't hold a grudge against anyone, and he was sincere and kind in everything he did. And this is one of the qualities I admire about him the most. It's a well-known fact that the Prophet was a family man. He, had a, he, had a, he was well respected in society before and after his prophethood. Throughout his life, people always talked about him as an honest, truthful, caring man. Well, one example of this is when he took his, his uncle's name was Abu Talib, and he took his son under his care because Abu Talib had a lot of kids, so he wanted to reduce his uncle's burden. So he took, he took one of his children upon him and raised him, took care of him. And this is, this is quite significant because it inspired another fellow Muslim to take another one of Abu Talib's kids and raise him. So as one, one of his actions caused a ripple effect in the society, which I find really significant. What else? Uh, but as, as to return the favor, his uncle made sure to protect and care for him in the initial stages of his prophethood when there was a lot of he was, when the Prophet was facing a lot of adversity and a lot of violence and that kind of stuff. And not, not just, he had, he had many uncles and aunts and he, he made sure, he didn't just take care of their material needs, but he also took care of their spiritual needs. He, and he also made sure he always, he always maintained good relations with them. He, he's explicitly told us to not to burn bridges with our family members. And I'm sure your parents, grandparents have taught everyone in this room the same thing. He's quoted saying, treating your kin with the same kindness as they treat you is not caring and looking out for them. But the one who t takes care of his kin even after they've broken relations with him is the one who truly looks out for his people. The prophet without a doubt cared for his family and distant family and taught us, taught not only the people at the time how to treat their family, but the billion plus Muslims today. Along with his distant relatives, the prophet used to the Prophet loved his children, he, he, and sa as same as his relatives, he took care of their material and spiritual needs. He, I, this, is a, this is a very interesting fact. He used to wake up his daughter, he used to go to his daughter's house every morning and wake her up for morning prayers. And this, this is quite interesting because even after she was married and she, she had a man by her side, he used to still take care of her repeatedly day after day, which is quite different at the time. Uh, another one of his favorite pastimes was to spend time with his two grandchildren. He would, it, it's, he's been quoted saying there's, he was never happier than when he was with his two grandchildren. And think, think about it for a sec. A man, who, a man who had to lead a whole religion, give the whole community advice, fight religious wars, still took out time from his day to spend with his grandchildren. So not only did he teach us how to love our family, but from a parenting aspect, he taught us how to raise our children. And my mom here, and I'm sure the rest of the parents here know what it's like to, to treat your children correctly. Every single one of the Prophet's actions was meant to be an example for all Muslims. As I said earlier, I try to, I try to emulate his quality of genuine care and concern for people. I'm an active volunteer in my community and I plan on being one for the rest of my life. I've, I've done many types of volunteering, but my favorite probably has to be uh, tutoring children, because when you, when you see a child that's younger than you uh, solve a problem they've been struggling with or learning something new, they, you can see a, 
you can see a change in their emotion. And when I, well, when I was younger, I used to go, to, I used to struggle with the same stuff. So you know that, you know what they're going through. It makes you feel better. It makes me feel complete. So giving is something that the Prophet did in abundance, whether it be time, money, effort. It's, you, you have to give. That's why I, I firmly believe that. I also deeply care about my family and friends. My family is my rock. I never make a decision without them, and they're in the back of my mind 24-7. And I make sure to treat my mother, father, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins with the same respect that they treat me with, just like the Prophet taught us. My friends are also a huge part of my life. Not all of them are Muslim, but that doesn't affect the amount of respect I give them. There's, there's a story of the Prophet where he said, whenever there's a funeral procession going on, make sure you stand up and pay your respects to that person. So there was a funeral procession and the Prophet stood up and there was a man near him and he said, uh, it was the coffin of a Jew. He said, why did you stand up? And the Prophet boldly replied, he said, was he not a living being soul? So that, that right there is end all be all, that everybody, you need to treat everybody the same way, regardless of their religion, skin color. There is another story, which I recently found out about. It's, um, there's, there's, this, there's a monastery called St. Catherine's Monastery. It's one of the oldest monasteries in the world. And they had, uh, they had sent uh, a delegation to the prophet asking for his friendship and his protection. And the prophet sent back a charter he said that you have, our, you have our protection, you have our friendship. And the last words of the charter stated, no one of the Muslims is to deny this covenant until the last day. This guaranteed the eternal protection and friendship between Muslims and Christians until the last day. These acts show that the Prophet viewed everyone as equal, nothing more, nothing less. And, and the most important quality of, most important example of this quality of the Prophet, it's probably that he used to pray all night long for us, for children here, the adults there. We, we weren't even alive at the time. The last words that the Prophet said before he died were Ummati, which means, in Arabic, it means the people, my people. So a man who had so much care for people who didn't even exist at the time, I can't imagine how much emotion he had in his heart at the time. And even if I could emulate a tenth of that or a hundredth of that, it would be, I think that would be a fulfilling life. Most people will tell you I'm a kind, caring, loving, and respectful man. Yes, I have learned this through my parents and my family, but most of all, I've learned this through my religion, my God, and my prophet, Prophet Muhammad. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, here, here's my good friend, Rumi. I've known him since kindergarten. So. Thanks, Taha. Uh, so my name is Rumi Khan. I'm a rising senior at New York Charter High School. And today I will be talking about my role model. So this person is a seminal personality who is not only critical for the foundation of Islam, but also to me personally. Her name is Khadija al-Kubra. She was the wife of the Prophet. But first, let me tell you a little bit about her, just uh, historical facts. She was born in the mid-550s uh, and um, she was known originally for her extraordinary entrepreneurial prowess. She amassed a massive amount of wealth in the city of Mecca and lots of political power, which is very strange for women at the time. She used her wealth to serve the poor parts of Mecca and also to take care of her family members and the impoverished community. So she amassed her wealth by running a caravan business. She, she was in charge of over half of all the trade that went in and out of Mecca sending goods to the Byzantine Empire, across the ocean. So that, was, like, that gave her a lot of power in the region. And it also was unique because, again, um, a person of her you know, gender would not really usually have so much power or status. She was so famous that she went by the name Khadija al-Kubra. Al-Kubra means the great. So she was known as the great. So the story goes that um, she, of course, cannot run her caravan herself, so she had to hire a representative to run the caravan. So she looked around the community to find someone who was known to be honest or trustworthy, and she found a man who we now know as Prophet Muhammad. She hired him out for a few years to run the caravan, and once she got to know him personally, 
she realized that this was a very extraordinary individual. At the time, she was 45 and he was 25, and she offered to marry him. He, he responded by saying, I, I'm sorry, I'm not wealthy enough. I, I can't support a wife. I ha I'm going to have to say no. And she responded by saying, what if I told you that your wife could support herself? They agreed. <laughs> <laughs> so the time came for revelation where, where, the, where Muhammad became a prophet. This was a tumultuous time in his life. He would meditate at the cave in Athlid Hira, where he would ponder upon what was real, what wasn't real, what the meaning of life was. I'm sure many people do that. However, when the revelation came to him, he was thrown into a state of panic and confusion. He thought, he thought maybe I'm going crazy, like he didn't understand what was happening. He was nervous and lost and scared. And he didn't understand what was happening. So he reached out to the only person he knew he could trust, which was his wife. She mentored him, she believed him, and she helped him work through understanding what was happening to him. She also did some investigations of her own to try and understand what these revelations meant. She contacted one of her cousins, whose name was um, Waraka Ibn Nafal, who was an historian priest. And he basically explained what was happening. In his mind, this is just evidence that Muhammad would become the prophet of God. During those two years, Khadija handled a very unusual solution. She saw the Prophet, her husband, when he was most vulnerable and most human, and trying to understand what his purpose was in life. Not only did she understand what was happening, but she converted to Islam. She was the first Muslim. She helped the Prophet spread his message, and they remained married for 25 years. The relationship was very, very unusual for Arabia at the time. Even more unusual as the Prophet gained more influence in the region. For example, Khadija and the Prophet had a very loving and caring and very personal relationship. It was one based off of mutual advice giving, honest discussion and emotional support. Khadija even maintained her wealth and her trading empire while she was the Prophet's wife and used it to help spread the message across their area. She suffered when the Prophet suffered through starvation and embargo when the Muslims were, were uh, evicted from Mecca. The Prophet once said of her, when all others opposed me, she supported me. It's important to say that Khadija was, was the first Muslim woman, and she was also the first Muslim, and today we live in an era where Muslim women are portrayed as subservient, submissive, not exactly very independent, and it, it, I, find it, I find it satisfying that the very first Muslim was the complete antithesis to this trope. She was anything if, she was anything if not. Well, she was independent, of course. She ran her own business, so obviously she wasn't subservient. So she, so she grew up in the rather patriarchal society of Arabia, which meant there was a lot of barriers to her kind of success early on in her life. Yet, she negotiated her own life on her own terms, managed her family, and, and you know, made her own life. And that's, why, that's one of the biggest reasons why I think she's one of my role models. I admire her drive that she could, she had so, like, the, the, the card was, the, the deck was dealt against her, basically. And even despite that, she could make something of it. And it was impressive. But there's something else fundamental about her that I admire, which is her, uh, her perseverance. She saw the Prophet as not just a messenger of God and the leader of the Ummah, the community, but also as a vulnerable human. Through observation, she understood Prophet Muhammad in a way no other person ever could and ever will. That is something I try to do, and it's something I know is utterly impossible for me to even come close to matching. But there was something else that, that she had that, that I tried to emulate, which is the role of the comforter or, or the supporter. For example, I'm sure if you've been in school, you remember your school days, there was always students who were outcasts, people who had no friends, no, they weren't in any cliques, any social groups, they were tormented by loneliness, and, and you know, everyone really can shine, everyone is a gem, maybe they're not cut very well, but they can be. So, over the last few years, I found myself in the unusual situation where 
I see those kind of people, and I reached out to them over the last few years, and I can say that by playing the role of the comforter, by finding people who are lost and confused and bringing them close to me and trying to draw connections to them, it has built a network of friends that I, I just, I'm so grateful for. And some of my best friends are people I've met through this role of the comforter. So Sufi Muslims, they, they don't see gender, they, they don't see gender as two discrete things. They rather see them as, a, as, a, as, a, as like a scale a person can, can, can have. Uh, there's masculinity, there's femininity. So I can say that Khadija helps me find my feminine side and helps me express it in ways where I can make other people's lives better. So for me, Khadija isn't just a model for Muslim women, she's the model for all Muslims. Thank you. And uh, next up is Zainab. Thank you. Um, my name is Zainab Kamsar. I'm a sophomore at MIP Charter High School. So the person I want to talk to you about today is one of the most influential women in the history of Islam. Uh, she was the Prophet's daughter, the wife of the fourth Khalifa, and the first woman teacher in all of Islam. First, I want to include a short biography of her life, then go on to explain why I picked her as my role model. The name of this person is Fatima. Born around 605 in Mecca, she was the only one of the Prophet's children who outlived the Prophet himself. When her mother, Khadija, died, she took such good care of her father that she was given the title of Umma Biha, and this means the mother of her father. Even as a child, she was an example to everyone, as can be seen in this example. After Khadija died, the Prophet married Umm Salama. Umm Salama was asked to tutor um, Fatima. And when asked, she replied, How can I tutor one who is the personification of high virtues and purity? It is I who should learn from her. During her childhood, Fatima faced many hardships. The enemies of the Prophet constantly harassed him by cursing at him, throwing stones, and beating him. And this increased when Khadija, his wife, and Abu Talib, his uncle, passed away. Each time this happened, Fatima would take care of her father and she would tend to his wounds. Even though she saw how her father was treated, she was never discouraged and she always had faith in him and in Islam. Her family was mocked and humiliated every day and yet she still um, went through with her faith and she was, yeah, she always had faith. When she was about 18 years old, suitors started asking her father for her hand in marriage. And, but the prophet turned down each of them politely as he was waiting for a sign from God. Um, then um, it was seen that Fatma was the model for young women at that time, and Ali was the model for young men at the time. So it was seen that after um, Fatma's consent was gained, they got married, and they moved to a house that was close to both the Prophet and the mosque. They had four children together named Hassan, Hussein, Zainab, and Umm Kuthum. An idea of how generous a family they are can be understood of how they had to fast for three whole days because um, each time someone new would come to their door, first it was a beggar, then an orphan, then a prisoner, and they each asked for food, so they gave it all away. Um, yeah. So the Prophet had a lot of admiration for Fatima, and whenever she arrived at the mosque, he would stand up in respect to her. This wasn't just in respect to his daughter, but in respect to women at that time, because it was really uncommon for women to be respected in the Arabian society. Every morning, the Prophet would go to the front of her house and say, Peace and blessings on the people of the household of the Nabi. The Nabi would be like the Prophet's kin. So the Prophet did this so that he could show to his companions that the house and its occupants were very special to Islam and to Allah and that they would res be respected after his death. The way Fatma died was told in a very moving manner by Asma bint Umais, who was someone that stayed at their house and helped with household chores. Fatma had just prepared food and told Asma that she was going to pray. Uh, Fatma would usually say takbir, which is a greeting to Allah, loudly at certain intervals. So when Asma heard nothing, she went to check in on her and found that she had passed away. After she told Ali, she went back home to um, give the children, to feed the children. And the children said that they wouldn't eat without their mother present. And then she had to tell them that their mother had died. 
Um, as, ha as Ali was bathing Fatma for the last time, he cried very loudly, and it is said by some historians that she was buried in her own home, which is now the Masjid i Nabavi. So Fatma led a very hard yet admirable life, and she's known by two different names, Zahra, which means the Lady of the Light, and Sayyidat Nisal Amin, which means leader of the women of the world. She set the example for how a wife, daughter, and mother should be, and the importance given to her shows her virtues. So although the Prophet was mocked for not having any sons, uh, Fatma was very important in his eyes, and she was the one who to continue the family line with her children, and these were the only grandchildren of the Prophet. There are certain parts of Fatma's life that I would like to point out, and these are what inspired me to write about her. The first is that she was a teacher. At a time when women were degraded and given little to no worth, she was a teacher and she would take the knowledge that she learned from the Prophet and teach it to both men and women. And another important characteristic is that even as a child, she respected and took care of her father as if she was a grown woman. Her personality is also very admirable as she never lied and was pure of heart. She was the first woman who learned Islam firsthand from the Prophet himself. I want to be able to manifest her values and virtues in my daily life. I want to be a caring daughter to my parents, a friend and a teacher to my friends and siblings, and sincere and devoted member of my community. I want to show to the world that role models like Fatma um, show that Islamic culture really respects and cherishes women. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you, and good morning. My name is Ruhi Khan, and I'm a rising freshman at New York Charter High School. During the eighth grade, while choosing an idea for my term paper, I not only gained a topic, but a role model. Malcolm X's story may not be as well known as Martin Luther King Jr., but he was equally important to the civil rights movement. One day, when Malcolm X's mother was home alone with her three young children and pregnant with him, Ku Klux Klan members came pounding at their door with shotguns and rifles, demanding Malcolm's father, the Reverend Earl Little. Even before his birth, Malcolm X was feeling the effects of being a civil rights activist given to him in his blood from his father. Events like this continued throughout Malcolm X's life into adulthood, leading him into a life of crime and dissatisfaction. Malcolm moved to New York City and in Harlem gained his infamous nickname, Detroit Red. Inevitably, Malcolm X was caught for some criminal endeavor or the other and he was sent to prison. There, Malcolm began reading and studying and embraced the honor rule student persona he was able to have as a child. Malcolm discovered the magnificence of faith, specifically Islam. He had read books on Islam and in prison, he converted. This was the first of two very big changes in his life. Malcolm X found a purpose. He wanted to do good, not bad. So after he was released, Malcolm X became a member of the Nation of Islam. Its leader, Elijah Muhammad, was Malcolm X's idol and he respected him immensely. The Nation of Islam was a black supremacist group, meaning, meaning that their goal was not to spread equality, but to put down non-blacks and said that race defined one's level of superiority. Malcolm X began preaching the NOI's theory and with his charismatic personality and powerful way of speaking, Malcolm X quickly caught the attention of not only fellow African Americans wishing for a better life, but whites intent on keeping their power. Soon, Malcolm X had overtaken the Nation of Islam and had become the main spokesperson becoming even more popular than Elijah Muhammad. But even more influential in American history, Malcolm X's growth caused something else. Malcolm X's encouragement of self-defense and fighting back was often misinterpreted as violence, but someone who didn't advocate violence was Martin Luther King Jr. Although most who enjoyed their ways of discrimination disliked the civil rights movement altogether, having people fight back against unfair treatment caused problems for them. So it's not like Malcolm X's words can be hidden, but they could get overwritten. Newspapers, radios, and TV would feature MLK rather than Malcolm X. MLK was propelled into popularity that gained him support from not just blacks and whites, not just blacks, but whites too, whereas Malcolm X was feared by whites. When Elijah Muhammad was caught with several affairs, some even bearing children, Malcolm X was distraught. All of his thoughts and beliefs crashed in on him, and rather than keep silent like Elijah Muhammad wanted, he renounced his membership and left to complete Hajj. Hajj is an Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca once a year. Muslims must complete this pilgrimage at least once in their lives. It's a three-day event including Eid al-Adha, a holiday celebrating Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, and, devo and his devotion to God as he was willing to sacrifice his own son to God. 
While on Hajj, Malcolm X achieved yet another remarkable life change. He saw people of different skin colors interacting as equals. Up until now, Malcolm X had only received hostility from other people of other skin colors. But while on Hajj, he saw that not only is racial equality an option, but a completely real and achievable concept. He realized that the nation of Islam's beliefs and philosophy did not overlap with Islam. After discovering that he was doing bad yet again under Elijah, he still managed to reform himself. He changed his name and took on a new philosophy. After Hajj, Malcolm X, now El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, preached equality and peace. Sadly, he did not make as large of an impact as he could have as he was assassinated by a member of the Nation of Islam. There were three major parts in Malcolm X's life with two major changes in him and his philosophy. Malcolm X went from crime to good intent to good intent with good outcome. Being misled isn't a bad thing, unless your ways and mistakes aren't noticed and you don't improve yourself. Malcolm X is a perfect example of being misled and changing himself till he got to the right place. And his life taught me that. Not many people are able to recognize their flaws. And even if they do, reforming themselves completely is even more rare. Malcolm X did this not once, but twice, in a way that benefited those who needed it. When African Americans suffered from racial inequality, he stood up for them because they couldn't. This is the Islam Malcolm X taught me, to recognize flaws and address them with changes. And with your improved self, go out and do something to make other people's lives easier and better. Malcolm X, as a Muslim and as an American, is a very influential role model to me. And in his words, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. Thank you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والصلاة والسلام وعلى رسول الله أما بعد. With the last name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, praise be to God, most gracious and most merciful, Master of the day of judgment. Thee do we worship, and thine aid do we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of whom thou hast bestowed thy favor. Those whose portion is not wrath, and of those who go not astray. I mean, good morning, peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum to you, wonderful children. I'm a crybaby. I'm wiping tears from my eyes because they really touch my soul. Uh, and you can hear it in my voice. Uh, to know that uh, with me, uh, Islam has saved my life. Let me give you a little bit of history of me right quick. Uh, I learned about Islam, I mean, I learned about religion in Zion Lutheran Church on 6th and Jackson Street when I was a teenager. When they moved to Newcastle, uh, Lancaster Avenue, I was there also. The thing that, tr I'm a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I'm 70 years old. I've been in the human rights struggle. I don't like the term civil rights. I like the term human rights because the Constitution at one time said that my people were three-fifths of a man. And if you look at me, you see the whole man. I <laughs> uh, wondered, uh, I went to, after I came home from service, <clears throat> I had very distorted thoughts in my mind of what I wanted to do to people who I thought was subjecting the racist prejudice against us. Uh, I sang in the choir with a half a pint of liquor in my back pocket. And singing in the choir, one of the best singers. And uh, one time I was singing and I was supposed to say Jesus and I said baby. And my wife said a bolt of lightning is going to hit you one day and you need to change your way. We were having little family problems and she read the Quran and she said if you're going to live by this, I'll come to, back to you. And we haven't had any problems since 1973. Wow. I've been married for 46 years. And I always speak, even though she's not here, I always speak and say if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be standing here, sitting here, talking to you today. I got one of the members of my community here. Uh, Catherine, would you stand up and let them see who you are, please? I call her my adopted daughter. She said she never thought she'd have an African-American father. And I said I never thought I'd have a European daughter. But uh, like I heard one of the speakers say, uh, one of the young speakers say, when you reach out and help somebody, regardless of their nationality or ethnic persuasion or faith, it's a beautiful thing. 
I have another friend I want to mention too, John. John, please stand up and let him know you're my friend. We, we work together in an interfaith group. I'm in a many, uh, uh, several interfaith groups. I helped to start the coalition to dismantle the new Jim Crow, if you heard of that. I also have a faith meeting group that we meet once a month at uh, Trinity Presbyterian Church to talk over the problems in the community that not only affect the African American community, that affect all Americans. Uh, I'm not a Negro, Coon, Shine, Afro America, African American. I'm a Moroccan American, a Moorish American, Moroccan American, whose names are on the original copy of the Constitution, the Eels and Bays, if you see original copy, because the copy they're giving out, our names are erased. Those Moors uh, had the first treaty of friendship, uh, which was with the Kingdom of Morocco, not the Ottoman Empire, the Moorish Empire of North Africa. Uh, the Treaty of Friendship is over two or three hundred years, I think it was 1734. This was the first Treaty of Friendship of any country in the world with the United States of America. That's why I take my citizenship and my service, uh, service in the service uh, to the point that when I speak, I speak as an American, not just as a so-called African American. The trials and tribulations of doing, bringing an African American, so-called African American, Muslim in America, has been no different than the racial uh, problems that my community has had. Uh, segregation, Jim Crow, uh, the black code laws, all these things affected us. As I journeyed through my life, I was trying to find out what the young brother said about who I am, what is my purpose. Uh, I struggled with that. Uh, I was, uh, went to college to be an elementary school teacher. I left because they was taking me back to the 12th grade and I was 24 years old with a Vietnam veteran experience and I didn't feel like going back to the 12th grade because I couldn't even remember it. So I eventually became and I taught myself how to be an elementary school teacher. Uh, and from that experience, I learned that uh, education starts at home because when we went to the public school systems, we couldn't find ourselves, even today in my community. We can't, our kids have not been able to find themselves, especially after the 1979 School Desegregation Act that took the city of Wilmington, uh, who had historical, very historical values to the Underground Railroad, uh, with Harriet Tubman coming up, Governor Prince Boulevard, where our, our institution is right now. Um, our kids got none of that. So the violence that you see going on in the African American community today is a direct result of that 1979 School Desegregation Act that they got little or no information about who they were. So outside of being an African American, being a Muslim, my dad said, uh, boy, uh, you already got one strike against you because you're black. Now you want to be a Muslim. <laughs> but when I studied, I definitely studied, when I studied, and I went to West Africa in 1983 on a business deal, and they asked me who I was, and I said I was a Moor, and one, one Muslim said, I'm Moor? What? And a guy came down from the third floor and said, did he say he was a Moor? I said, yes. He said, my grandfather was a Moor. That is all I needed to know who I am and found my, my dean, my religion, so I know my nationality, and I know my dean, my religion, so this is what I usually programate to young African-American children. Uh, I've been going in and out of the penitentiary for over 45 years, saying the same things I'm saying to you now. And the things that I taught them the most was how you got there, how you're going to get out of there, and how you're going to stay out of there. And if you don't remember those three things, you're going to be in bad trouble. Uh, as a Muslim, I was in an organization called the Provisional Government of the United Moors Republic. We operated a nonprofit group called Black Man's Development Center. Black Man's Development Center was against crime and drugs and et cetera. And some of you, if you're old as me, you might have seen me knocking on your doors out here in the community soliciting for that. Uh, from that, when we broke up because of vanity and didn't want to practice the religion, et cetera, I went to the Muslim Center of Wilmington in 1976. And from that experience, I taught them birthright, 
Moorish birthright, and there my late leader, Imam Ward D. Muhammad, he was called America's Imam, and most of us have never even heard of him. He was the seventh child of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of the Nation of Islam. He never practiced that old jargon from the Nation of Islam. His father always made him learn of the orthodox traditions of Islam. Uh, they sent him to school in the uh, overseas for a number of years. And most, again, most Americans don't know anything about him because he wasn't like uh, the Minister Farrakhan when they put him all out there and tell what he had to say. <laughs> Imam Warthi Muhammad was the first Muslim to give the invocation of Congress in 1996. He also was in the Vatican in 1999, spoke to over 100,000 Christians. And I think some of that influence of his speech also affected our new Pope who said that he's a sinner like everybody else and don't put him on that pedal stool that you put all the rest of the pokes on. And if you study him like I've studied him, you find that he's a true man of faith and I appreciate all his efforts in helping the poor. Because the most down throttened individuals with all the chaotic confusion that's in the world today, we know that poverty is the basic cause for all the uproars everywhere. But the what what you may say something crazy. But what pisses me off, excuse my language, the most <laughs> is that those who are affected the most by all the turmoil all over this planet Earth right now are the women and the children and the elderly. And a couple of days ago, I found out I'm one of the elderly. <laughs> so the transition to, to Islam has, has been a beautiful one for me because, you know, being a historian, uh, uh, studying it, and uh, watching how some Americans are putting it out that uh, Islam is a terrorist, extremist group of people, uh, I, I, I bear witness that that's not true. Because if it wasn't for the Quran, I'd be in jail or dead now based on the ideas and concepts I had when I came home from Vietnam. Because, like one of the, one of the young kids said, when the Prophet Muhammad, the prayer of the peace of Allah be upon him, uh, sent some people to Abyssinia, which is in Ethiopia and Africa, when they were being persecuted, the thing that touched me the most was that he didn't go. And they said, why are you not going with all this persecution upon you? Why are you not going? Because your mission, his mission was in Mecca, commissioned by God to spread the words of peace and love. Uh, that touched my soul real, real, real deeply. And another thing in the Quran, it says, Et, if you have any animosities against any human being, if you made it to heaven, that you wouldn't get in the gate unless you went back and apologized to those people. Now, I used to say, well, how can you do that? God can do whatever he wants to do at any time. He, he got me here speaking today because of, of my commitment to the principles of one for your brother and sister, what you want for yourself. Now, when I was in Medina a couple years ago, I seen another translation that said, one for humanity, what you want for yourself. And that changed my whole way of, of thinking because I have a, a, a lady named Miss Faye Whittle. She does a prison ministry called uh, Prison Ministry. And uh, she reminds me of my mother. And whenever she sees me, she says, oh, here's my mom. And I get so embarrassed. Because mostly it's a crowd of European Americans like this. She hugs me in. My wife said, who's that? I said, that's my second mother. <laughs> and when Norm died, her husband died, uh, we really got close because she was distraught. And uh, she said, I don't know what to do. I don't have Norm. I said, Norm is a spirit. And that spirit in Norm is still in you. So I told her, Norm would not want you to stop doing what you're doing, and he, she did it, and she loves me, and I send her emails every day, and she thanks me, and etc. cetera. Uh, so our struggle, because he said I got three minutes, but I had to give it that to you. I don't get a chance to talk to a whole European community crowd of faith people, and I really feel a good vibe in here, and I thank you for that. Um, the, the, the real struggle, again, is, is, uh, is, is racism. And that's been the primary uh, struggle for my people, Muslims and non-Muslims. And I want to leave you uh, with this thought here. If you haven't found or seen this book, this is Thomas Jefferson and the Quran. 
and the struggle that him and James Madison and, and John Adams had to get the First Amendment of freedom of religion for anybody in the United States of America. Uh, I wasn't going to read it at first because it's Spielberg name, and Spielberg made me think of all them crazy pictures that one of them guys put out. And, uh, and a guy told me at a meeting in, at Villanova University, you need to get this book and read it. And I've only read the, the uh, introductory uh, for the last month because it has shown me the opposition back then in the 1700s that was against my religion of Al-Islam and the people who were killed, press pastors and ministers who was killed upholding that principle that Freedom of religion is granted to all of those of us who are Americans. And my friend Pat Downing of Trinity Church made this statement at a rally we were at, and I'll conclude. She said, the dominant culture must learn how to give up some of those white privileges now to all citizens of America. And if we do that, we'll have a better community, a better country, because all the ills that destroyed Rome is right here in the United States of America. And I believe, humbly, that the only group of people in America that can change <coughs> those kind of conditions are people of faith, not the secular community, but the people of faith, the people that love God, love being human beings, love the society of human beings. And when I learned that the first society that I should be thinking about was the human society, I'm telling you, it changed my whole life. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be on you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. The way you respond is wa alaikum assalam. Okay. Um, so wanted to start off with the with the um, saying of the. Uh, Prophet Jesus and Prophet Muhammad that were shared at the beginning about the neighbor. Uh, in another narration, uh, the answer to who's my neighbor uh, was given as um, that 70 houses in each direction. And 70 in Arabic basically uh, in, in, is interpreted as there's no count. So. Uh, so everybody is a neighbor uh, who shares this world with us. Um, so I was asked to give an overview of the growth of the Muslim community in Delaware. Uh, Muslims have always been here, uh, you know, even from the uh, times of the Swedes. You know, the first uh, ships that came in, uh, there were uh, black Muslims on those ships. And in more recent history, uh, 1953, uh, and, uh, Imam Umar can correct me, nine, 1953 is when the first mosque uh, in Delaware uh, opened its door called Masjid al Kautar. Uh, the masjid is still, uh, uh, you know, open, and it's one of the one of the few, one of the um, largest Islamic centers in the state of Delaware. Um, the second uh, important, um, the third, you know, after the, the original uh, Swedes, Muslims coming with the Swedes on Swede ships, and then 1953 with the Nation of Islam, uh, then the third important event happened with the uh, with the new immigrants coming in in the in the 50s and 60s uh, from Muslim countries, and. That led to the formation of an organization called Islamic Society of Delaware, and I have a couple of rep couple of original founders uh, right here, Dr. Salim Khan, <laughs> and his his wife uh, Sabira Khan, <laughs> and my adopted uncle. Uncle Tufel Chaudhary. Um, so, so they were behind that the third wave of, of Muslim community uh, finding home and refuge 
in Delaware. Um, they've been here uh, for over 40 years. Um, you know, uh, some may have a little more, some a little less, uh, but that was the third important uh, wave. More recent wave has been not that old, actually, within the last 10 years. The Muslim community has seen a tremendous amount of growth in Delaware. Uh, in 2009, uh, my family moved into Delaware. Uh, we came from North Carolina. And uh, my wife, um, who, uh, who has a, a doctorate in education from the University of North Carolina, she decided to open a school, an Islamic school, uh, in New York, Delaware. And that school has become a magnet for a lot of um, uh, migration to Delaware for Muslim community. Uh, not a lot of Islamic schools, you know, especially you know the ones that have a have a a good understanding of what does it mean to be American Muslims, and what does it mean, what does it take to create the next generation of Muslim Americans. Uh, you know, not a lot of those exist. Uh, so as people hear about it, people start to move. Another important step that happened was as with the, with the formation. Even before this school, there was always an effort to form an Islamic school. But uh, more like Sunday schools that we have, you know, even in churches, uh, those types of schools started, you know, because a few motivated people who really wanted to make a difference, they did an effort. After three, four years, you know, the steam runs out, they get tired, others, you know, some people may not be happy, so they feel discouraged, right? <laughs> would, you, would you guess that I'm talking about an Islamic school? <laughs> um, stream runs out, feel discouraged, and they say, okay, you know, I'm done, I've done my part, somebody else needs to take a baton. And then, you know, three, four years later, another group of uh, people will start another Islamic school, and that had been happening for, you know, uh, since the since the mid 90s, in 2009, uh, when uh, my wife Dr. Amna Latif she started the school, that also created another um, uh, you know uh, a kind of uh, uh, motivation for for people who had already been doing schools that they also needed to get their act together and then all of a sudden there were two Islamic schools. You know, on one side there were there was not even a single consistent school, but then on the other hand there were there there were two Islamic schools. So in two thousand ten uh, another Islamic school opened. And because of these two schools, the community has benefited significantly. Uh, it has increased the offering, it has in, it has fulfilled the needs of the of the community. The children going to these Islamic schools, they are, they are very confident of their Muslim identity and they're very confident of their American identity. They don't have any confusion. Uh, not to say that kids who did not go to uh, an Islamic school would have a confusion. I mean, they have done a tremendous job and you have seen those four children. Those are examples of the kids who did not have an opportunity to go, in and go to an Islamic school and, and they are doing very well, aren't they? Thank you. Um, so, uh, it's, so starting 2000, um, uh, 2006, 2007, more Islamic centers started to open. Uh, right now in Newark area alone, within a four or five mile radius, we have four uh, Islamic centers. Uh, one, of course, in the, in, in the city of Newark, uh, the oldest one would be the Islamic Society of Delaware. Uh, but now we have um, Masjid Isa uh, Ibn Maryam. Masjid Isa basically means Mosque of Jesus, um, the Son of Mary. Uh, that's the name of the mosque. The uh, other two mosques, one is called Delaware Islamic Center. Uh, Delaware Islamic Center is uh, in Newcastle, um, uh, close to Newcastle Walmart. And we have, uh, yeah. We have uh, president of that mosque right here, uh, Brother Mustafa Tunjer. Um, and the fourth uh, mosque is called Glasgow Mosque. So these are, these are all just in uh, Newark area, you know, surrounding area. 
Then in, in the city of Wilmington, of course, the oldest mosque, uh, Delaware's oldest mosque, uh, Masjid al Um uh, In addition to that, there are two other mosques. Um, uh, one of them has recently opened up in the last two, three years. Uh, there, there is a very new uh, Islamic center. It's more Shia uh, you know, sect of Islam. But most of the other ones, they are primarily uh, you know, Sunni uh, mosques. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> so, in our count, Delaware Council's count, we count about 12 mosques across the state. So, eight of them just in Newcastle County. Uh, the remaining four down south, uh, you know, uh, we have plenty of other mosques. Uh, the Muslim community, uh, if you go to one of the Eid prayers, um, you know, you'll see, uh, according to some counts, and I don't have a uh, an official confirmation on that, but people would would claim you know six to seven thousand uh, Muslims coming to the the um, Eid prayer. Uh, the next Eid prayer is going to be on September thirteenth, the same day as the primary elections uh, in the morning. So hopefully we'll have a better turnout because uh, people should be able to go back and do their votes. Uh, so with that, I give it back to Dr. Khan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, that's peace be upon all of you. Thank you very much for Becca. I can see her now. So thank you, Becca, for invite for having this uh, program and inviting me. I used to tell Becca that I am her token Muslim friend. <laughs> so now she has more. And I'm so happy to see a lot, a lot of my friends here. Um, so when I get nervous, I'm going to you know, look at them. <laughs> um, you know, with all the growth of Muslim community here in Delaware, I think it, these kind of programs are really important because uh, they say, um, according to some survey that a lot of like 70 percent or 60 percent Americans do not know a Muslim. Um, they, they have never met a Muslim. Although 90 percent of those who have met a Muslim have a positive opinion about Muslims. But even if you, you know, if I have spent time with my friends, people have good opinion about one person. Like she's a Muslim, maybe she's a good one. You know, not the rest are probably all crazy. <laughs> so it's very important to have programs like these to provide a safe environment for uh, for wider American public to ask questions, to learn from us, to have uh, you know difficult questions answered. Um, and one of the most misunderstood and stereotyped issue regarding Islam and Muslim, of course, after you know the concept of that all Muslims are terrorists, the next one is the treatment uh, and status of women in Islam. And there's a lot of misunderstanding and um, questions around that, um, that topic. And so from the typical image of veiled non-entity to the tears of oppression, the topic is loaded with negative stereotypes and uh, negative perception. So, you know, I grew up in Pakistan. Um, I was, uh, you guys are going to know my age after I tell you the whole numbers, but <laughs> <laughs> I was 20 years old when I came here, and that was 25, 24 years ago. <laughs> I still have one year. So, <laughs> so most of my, I, I would say, like, I grew up as a devotional Muslim, um, and not but I learned to become an intellectual Muslim in the United States. So most, most of my uh, growth as an intellectual person or, or as an uh, intellectual American Muslim was uh, you know, credited to the environment I lived in. I tried to learn by, for myself, by myself and my daughters. I have two daughters and a son. Um, and my oldest is in college right now, and she's the one who actually, you know, She's uh, people who know her know that she's the one uh, who pushed me to learn more about Islam by asking questions. So I learned for myself what was the status and roles and responsibilities and uh, rights given to Muslim women in, in Islam. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I get my, all the Muslims get their guidance from two original sources, Quran, Quranic teachings, and um, Hadith tra tradition, which is prophetic saying and the way he lived his life. All, and also, you know, there's like 1400 years of scholarship as well, which goes along, but you know, so we have plenty of material to learn from, but the, if we have really pressing question, we go back to the original sources, which is Quran and uh, the prophetic traditions. And I found out like in many verses in Quran, emphasize the equal nature and humanity for men and women both. Both men and women were created from uh, one male and female according to many you know, verses in Quran. So they have common origin and common nature. And in Quran, God says, this is one of my favorite verses and it's also talk a lot about um, the diversity. So it says, oh humankind, we created you from a female and a male, and we made you into nations and tribes, so you may know each other and not despise each other. Um, the most noble of you in the sight of God are those who are the most righteous. Indeed, God is all-knowing, omniscient. So this is the, this is, so that sort of told me that this diversity is by design. And you know, we are all, we could have been created just one, yeah, like mono looking uh, people, but we were not. It's just to add little fun, little, you know, zest to life. But it's not to despise each other, but it is to know each other. And also tell us that all human are equal and their differences based on race, ethnicity, and gender should not be a source of arrogance or division. That di so this diversity is by design to celebrate each other. And the value is based not on God-given external qualities, but how the person's character is, how his personality, how is to each other. The essence of Islam to me is to create a relationship with my creator and love his creation. That's the essence. And it, it's the same for men and women. Also, you know, with different teachings, Quran sort of paint out a, an ideal portrait of a true Muslim man and woman is to be to a believing, devout, humble person who worship, who prays, fast, gives charity, and constantly remember God in every day's life. And it's identical for both men and women. So these were and, and the reward is also so the responsibilities are identical and the reward is also identical for both men and women. Now comes the rights. So the more I studied Islam, more I learned about the rights given to women at the advent of seventh century. When we are talking about Prophet Muhammad's character and his um, dealings with other people and with women and women of the house, we have to remember this is, we are talking about seventh century. When, you know, if you compare, if you do a comparative study of seventh century in the rest <coughs> of the whole world, you know, those rights were really pretty radical at that time. So women were given the right to education. And, you know, the precedent after that is that Prophet Muhammad's wife was, uh, Aisha, was uh, the first, was, was the biggest female scholar. Like, so one of the saying of Prophet Muhammad was, take half of your religion for, from this fine woman, young woman. Uh, so she was one of the, uh, you know, most important female scholar at that time, not just female scholars, him, her students were, you know, very powerful, had become very powerful scholar after <coughs> learning from her. So right to education was the first right, right to own property, right to inheritance, right to uh, have a voice in political uh, and social gatherings and also even military, you know, um, spheres. Um, the, right to property and right to own inheritance and right to earn money and keep your money. I mean, if you see, if you, um, I started reading like Jane Eyre and all that, all those books, it wasn't given to European women until 19th century. I mean, that's pretty, and I was really surprised to read that. What, is that real or is this fiction <laughs> or just? <laughs> so, you know, those are the things which um, are pretty, um, you know, pretty impressive for me. Um, and more I learned about it, but, and it's not like I didn't grow up learning, knew all, knowing all these things because 
um, in Pakistan, in Karachi, I grew up, I, you know, I had all those rights. So I was enjoying all those rights in there. But I was, I didn't, I thought that was just part of the life. It's not, you know, something, um, something to celebrate. Well, the problem is that, I mean, there's no denying that some part of the world and women, actually, sadly, women in every part of the world are um, subject to a, you know, a lot of discrimination and a lot of, uh, so these, these ideals, these are the ideals, but are they the reality? Unfortunately, not 100%. And that's not, but that's also true to every part of the world. So just um, the, the problem with the stereotyping and considering that religion is the only factor which affect all uh, the, you know, um, injustice is done against women, Muslim women is, um, is actually inaccurate and it's counterproductive. It also shows that Muslims are painted as monolithic. Like they're just one kind of people. In fact, there are a lot of uh, other factors which affects people's behavior. Um, and some of the challenges as an American Muslim woman we're subject to face here um, in the United States is um, number one, stereotyping. That lacks, you know, it, it's the, so the common concept is that all American, uh, all Muslim women, and they do not make the people who make those stereotypes. They do not make the distinction of American Muslim women or women. So, if anything is happening thousands of miles away, people reflect that okay, all Muslims are like that, or all Muslim women who live in United States are being subjected to that. They are oppressed. They are uneducated. They don't know how to speak. You know, recent. Uh, y y the recent uh, comment of one of the presidential candidates was implying that, and it really made me mad because you know, people who know me know I speak a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and ask my husband, <laughs> so, he'll tell you. But it's just, you know, it's just dehumanizing for all of the Muslim women to paint them with one brush and just put them in one small, neat little box. So they are submissive. They have no or few rights. They're weird or they're uneducated. I usually tell the story about my, uh, you know, my decision to co start covering my hair, the my hijab story. So my friends who are here, they know that, uh, you know, I did not grow up wearing hijab. Or uh, this is a headscarf in um, in um, um, Arabic or in Urdu. My first language was Urdu. We call it hijab. In Pakistan, when I was growing up, I did not cover my hair. I lived in America for many years and I didn't cover my hair. And then my daughter asked me a question um, about what's the ruling of covering your hair in, um, in Islam. And she was, she was 10 years old, 12 years old. And I started st studying more about it. And I just felt my reason for wearing hijab or deciding to cover my hair was uh, to inculcate better relationship or spiritual relationship with my God. And that was devotion to God. So I have decided that I'm going to cover my hair. I talked to one of my friends here, the funny, <laughs> Caroline. She, I, I told her, you know, that's what I'm thinking. So I, we talked about it. Then I told my husband and he said, no, you cannot do that because this was after 9-11. And he said, he does not want to, uh, want me to attract, you know, negative attention or just making my life difficult in the, in the way it can make, you know, people's life difficult when they choose to stand out. Um, so I said, okay, I'm gonna give you a few months. Just get used to the idea <laughs> and when, yeah, in a few months, like you have to get used to it. Said, okay. But then I kept on studying and then there was a time when I just could not leave the house without covering my hair because I just want, you know, that was, I, I just wanted to have that relationship with my God. And then I told my husband, you know, this is my body, this is my hair, this is my choice. I'm going to cover it, you like it or not, you just get used to the idea. And he said, okay. <laughs> So, so this is such a contrary to the common perception. That, and, and some people ask me, so your husband made you do this? I said, no, not really. This was my decision. And also my daughters, they asked me this question um, my, that 
when we grow up, a few years ago, she asked me, when you grow up, do I have to cover my hair? And I said, I made this decision after my own, you know, connection with God and after my own understanding of this of Islam. So I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'll just encourage you to read more about it. And, you know, if a time comes that you feel like you have to do it, you do it. So both my daughters, one is in uh, um, a junior in college and the other is a senior at high school. They both don't cover their hair. Um, and, um, you know, I started covering my hair when I was 36 years old, so she, they, you know, it, it's, they, they still have plenty of time left <laughs> to decide. <laughs> so what are the sources of a stereotype? Media, of course. Um, up until a few, like, probably weeks ago, media usually, uh, I mean, there was no voice of Muslim women or American Muslim women in media. Um, the mostly, uh, it, it's hard. The only narrative which was um, easily available or readily available, which from American Muslim women, some of them, which either some ex-Muslim women who decided to leave the faith because of a personal, you know, personal issue or the way their father, like I'm, I'm talking about Ayana Ali Hirsi, um, who was a Somalian um, woman, Muslim woman, grew up in Somalia, and uh, because of, um, I mean, because of her father forcing her to marry. Pers uh, a person who she didn't like to, she left Islam and then she wrote you know, um, books about against Islam. And my problem with that is that just one incident or one person decision cannot negate the choice or uh, or faith of 1.6 billion Muslims. So, so but it's easier for wider American public to hear those voices than the voices of a person like myself. Um, so that's the media. Hollywood, you know, Hollywood exhaustified Muslim women from, you know, like, from ages. So Jasmine, mm -hmm. if you can tell, <laughs> Jasmine, or, um, you know, a lot of these films were, have been the source of portraying Muslim women in a, um, in a other person kind of way, which are, which are just a source of, they, were, they have been objectified pretty much. Books, there are a lot of books which, so Islam has to be taught in the context of his um, West, non-Western uh, religions in uh, social studies. And some of the schools chose a book of a 12-year-old Afghan girl who was married and divorced before she was 15. And that's not, that's not what Islam is about. That's a cultural story, an unfortunate one, but that's not what it, what the teachings are or what the true facts of Islam are about. So books have been found. Hate rhetoric, which I don't even have to explain now. Hate rhetoric is so prevalent at this time. And on mainstream media and mainstream life. And of course, actions of some Muslims. Um, and that's sad because some Muslims, um, while some Muslims do not deny all these um, rights to Muslim women due to their own patriarchal cultural norms or their extreme interpretation of religion. But many other Muslim um, believe that these rights come from uh, the original text. So that's making it authoritative. Um, so as I said, you know, this kind of discourse is, uh, it lacks proper context. It assumes and portrays, as I said, Muslim as a monolithic, which is too simplistic. Um, it, a woman, so national origin and um, um, culture plays a huge part. A woman in, uh, an educated woman in Malaysia, or even in a city of Pakistan, Karachi, is much different from a woman who is uh, in a small village in uh, Afghanistan or uh, you know any other small place. So there are a lot of factors which plays important part, important role in people's behavior. Education and profession, socioeconomic status, political situation, you know, all this, unfortunately, the instability, violence, and war is uh, making the you know, issue of women right um, um, much less priority than it should be. Because uh, that's one of the, you know, when, People are dying, and they're, you know, the kids are getting bombed. Women' right gets um, a backseat. Um, 
and the single focus obsession on hijab or the dress of Muslim women takes away the focus from real issues. I have one, one thing which I want to talk about is I was working with uh, a filmmaker who's planning to make a um, uh, documentary about American Muslims. And I asked him, what's the reason you want to make? What's the objective of this film? And he said, I want to show people that American Muslims are just like us. So I said, you know, 77% of American Muslims are citizens, American citizens. They're not just like us, they are us. So, I mean, that's, they are, you have to think, I mean, our um, brain should be changed into thinking that there are, um, we are talking about Americans who happen to uh, have a different faith than, you know, majority of the Americans. So that's the concept that will make us part of this conversation. Um, so, you know, the other, even if Muslim women do not wear hijab, they're, they still face racism and discrimination because the makeup of the, the composition of American Muslim um, population in the United States is, is uh, I think 35% African Americans, 28% um, white because Arabs are considered white um, as a race, and 28% um, South Asians. So, you know, even if we change our uh, clothes, we still cannot change our skin color, so our names, our origin. So that's the problem. I mean, race and discrimination is a very real issue. Employment issue, that cause employment issue. Profiling at airports, that, I mean, I have personally subjected to that, not just because, not myself, but my son, his, um, he was four years old, so I'm, I'm gonna end with this story. He was four years old and he's, um, He's my baby, so, uh, <laughs> and, and he was four, and he ever since I, I named when he was born, I named him Muhammad as first name, and then Asad and last name Sultan. So, and uh, I call him Asad, but um, like we call him with his middle name, but uh, his uh, name on the passport is Muhammad Sultan. Ever since he was a baby, he was stopped at the airport for uh, special screening. So when he was four years old, I uh, we were traveling, myself, my daughter, my middle daughter, and um, my son. We were traveling to Pakistan, and um, he was stopped again, and and I asked him why do you keep on stopping him? He said, you know, you can take his name off, uh, but we have to talk to someone. I said, okay. Well, we boarded at the plane. We were bracing ourselves for 18 hours flight, uh, kind of settled down. Then a woman came and she was looking at the boarding card and she said, who's sitting on this seat? I said, my son, he was four at the time. He said, he has to get off the plane, I have to be checked again because we did not check him properly. So I could not let him go alone because of course, you know, four year old with a stranger. So I left with him and my, left my 12 year old daughter behind, um, who's actually a very scaredy cat. So. Um, we get off and I was really mad. I usually am pretty subdued at airports because I don't want to, you know, I, I, I really want to oblige with every thing, but I was really mad and I told that person, you're just, and he was surprised as well. He said, so you're gonna get screen? I said, no, him, they're getting him off board because his name is Muhammad. And he said, no, he said, I don't know about that. I said, but I know about that. And so we get off and they, really patted him down they like checked his diaper bag and everything and, uh, and then we came back and so that's when i came back my daughter was crying her eyes out because she was scared she thought that the plane will fly away without you yeah, know without her mother and brother um and so we kind of got back and after that i contacted homeland security and i said you guys are wasting your res like taxpayers money and resources you're not gonna keep us safe by checking for your role. So got his name on uh, redress, um, on uh, got a redress number or something. But these are the real problems we are facing as parents, as you know, um, a member of the society. So I'm gonna stop here and I, I'm once again, I'm gonna uh, thank you so much for being here and for being so open-minded and learning about our faith. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. While our brave law enforcement officers are checking four-year-old Muhammads, <laughs> we have had three mass shootings yesterday. Just yesterday. 302 this year alone. So they, they will probably stop a four-year-old Muhammad while a 35-year-old Mo could walk by with the bazooka. So that's something that we need to really think about. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum to all of you. And uh, I want to start with a verse from the Quran. It might be advantageous for you to note the number. It's verse number 82 in chapter 5 because nobody has probably ever told you about this verse. What this verse tells us, it's talking to Muslims. God says, you will certainly find the nearest in friendship to you those who say that we are Christians. So this is the Quran saying to Muslims that you will find them closest to you in friendship, those who say we are Christians. And the reason why they will say to you that we are Christians and they will be friendly to you is because the Quran says they are not proud. So at least in the eyes of God, Christians are humble, welcoming, and friendly. Uh, you must have heard a lot about uh, how the Quran calls people to do this and do that. No, the Quran never addresses Christians and Jews as infidels at all. If anyone says that the Quran or Muslims have called out for killing inf Christians and Jews, they are liars. The Quran or always, mistake. always, <laughs> no, they know. Ten years ago, I would be willing to concede that people in this country were ignorant. They are not ignorant anymore. They are prejudiced when they talk about faith in a negative way. So it is, the Quran always addresses Christians and Jews as people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, never as infidels. So it's important to know that. The current political environment in which we are living has become extremely hostile and suffocating to Muslims. Uh, they are being scapegoated for a lot of problems in America which have nothing to do with Muslims. And that is something for us to understand truly that Muslims are being publicly excoriated for things that they are not responsible for. So since 2012, not just in this election, since 2012, that's John Carney. Since 2012, people have been lambasting Islam. If you remember the zero, uh, Ground Zero Mosque episode. And the media kept calling me all the time. And I, I kept wondering, and this is my first line, I said, call me back in December when the elections are over. Nobody in this country will care about the Ground Zero Mosque. Do you know anything about it? Have you ever heard of the Ground Zero Mosque since 2012 or since Newt Gingrich's campaign ended? Mm -hmm. so, so we have been scapegoated. So people are finding different terms. Apparently, if we use the word Islamic radicalism, all our problems will be solved. <laughs> I think we need to start using terms like American radicalism and our problems will truly be solved. <laughs> I want to read to you uh, something uh, important. Before that, I want to tell you that as Americans, there are five things which are very critical to the, to the well-being of this country. These are our five treasures and we must guard them very seriously. And those five treasures are, number one, our democracy and our freedom. Number two, the strength of our civil society. Number three, the vitality and the ingenuity of our economy. Number four, the spiritual heritage and culture that we have. The enormous amount of charity and, and uh, wonderful supportive work that all these churches and synagogues and temples and mosques do in this country comes from our spiritual heritage. And finally, the most important thing also is our diversity. Without our diversity, we will not have the vitality, either spiritually or economically, that will make our country thrive and renew itself frequently. The reason why America has continuously become great, and the reason why America continues to dominate in the, for, the, for nearly a century now, is because we don't stagnate. And the reason we don't stagnate is because of the diversity that comes to this country through immigration. And that is something very important for us to understand. Uh, James Madison, in the Federalist paper number 51, which he wrote in 1788, said something very incredible. 
He said that in a free government, the security of civil rights must be the same as that of religious rights. And so while he was talking about federalism, he argued that the security for civil rights must be the same as that for religious rights. It consists in the one case in the multiplicity of interests and in the other in the multiplicity of sects. Sects as in religious sects. So what Madison was trying to say is the reason why America will remain a free society is if power is not concentrated in the government. Like you don't have a tyrant ruling. You just have to look at the Muslim world to understand what he didn't want in America. You don't have one man accumulating and sucking all power and becoming an emperor or a caliphate or a sultan. And in order to do that, he said the key against the state becoming tyrannical is not just that we respect multiple political interests, but also respect the multiplicity of religious sects. Because both these interests, the political multiplicity and religious multiplicity, are in pursuit of a shared common good. Are in a pursuit of the shared common good. So without using the word pluralism, he defined what pluralism is for us. America was always pluralist. If you look at Article 6, the Article 6 demands that people who are elected officials, people who are executives in this country, people who hold offices such as the Office of the Justice, as cops, as senators, congressmen, they all have to affirm through the process of oath that they will uphold this constitution. But what Article 6 also says is that there will be no religious test as a qualification to hold any public office in this country. And that is an interesting thing. My son was trying to convince me that maybe this Article 6 was to include people like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson who were deists and not Protestants. But what is interesting is that when Article 6 was discussed in this constitution, people actually spoke up and said that we need to ensure that there is no religious test for holding public office to ensure that Catholic Jews and Muslims could hold office. And they actually debated the possibility that one day somebody, a Muslim, maybe with a middle name Hussein, could become president of this country. <laughs> they actually debated that. They could have included a clause saying Muslims shall not be president of this country or hold any office. They did not do that. So the foundation of this country is based on a pluralistic view, which includes the multiplicity of religious sects. And unfortunately, the current political environment is putting that very thing at risk. That very thing at risk. We, we are going through a very trying circumstances. We have very serious problems in all these five things that I was talking about. This, every time you hear on Fox News, which says that traditional America is in trouble, that is quote for white people are losing power. Not just white people, white Christians are losing power because nobody likes Bill Maher being in charge, right? He may be white, but he's not <laughs> a believer. He's an atheist. So this, these codes, these are fears of a transforming America. And, and that, plus, our economy is not as vital as it used to be or ought to be. So because we are facing these challenges, and of course we are also facing security challenges, we have to make sure that the key to America's success, the key to America's vitality is its diversity and pluralism. It should be preserved. Uh, I want to share something very interesting. One of the most interesting thing is that as to how Muslims have always been part of this country. When we were debating Article 6, we were talking about Muslims. In the war of independence of this country, Muslims fought. One of the key battles was the Battle of Bunker Hill. I'm sure all of you must have read about it. The British foolishly charged the mountain. They were led by a guy, his name was uh, let me, Major General John Pitcairn. He charged up the mountain thinking he will take care of these uh, ill-trained, incompetent natives. And a man called Peter uh, let me get his name, Buckminster shot and killed him. He was an African American. He was a slave who fought for five years and he was given his freedom for fighting for America in the War of Independence. He continued to fight for the US in the military several years after becoming free, but the one thing that he did the moment he became free, he changed his name to Peter Salam. He was a Muslim. 
It was a Muslim who shot the British officer at the Battle of Bunker Hill. We don't recognize this. I wonder if Donald Trump has ever read the history of the country that he wants to rule. Ask him too much. <laughs> you know, he owes his freedom to Peter Salam, and the name is also so beautiful, St. Peter and Peace. But there were other Muslims who fought. There was someone called uh, Joseph Ben Ali, who was Yusuf Ben Ali, who fought for several years in North Carolina and, and others. But what is also interesting is there's somebody called Bampet Muhammad. I couldn't find much on Bampet Muhammad to share. But George Washington knew many Muslims. He had a slave called Sambo. And it was very interesting. This Sambo was like a buddy of his. And Sambo had two wives. And some of his puritanical friends were upset, and they started writing letters to George Washington saying, why does Sambo has two wives? Then I can't, I guess. <laughs> so George Washington, in his response, said, it is because of his faith. His faith. He is a Muslim. His faith allows him to practice polygamy, so I allow him to practice polygamy. But what was interesting with his relationship with Sambo was that he would go to Sambo's, wherever Sambo lived, in hut or whatever, and buy honey, and he would actually buy stuff from his slave. I found that very fascinating, but they were buddies. They were not like, they were master and slave in law, but socially they were buddies, and they often sat and had lots of conversations. And of course, you know the story of Jefferson, who, who brought a Quran with him and shared it with it. When Keith Ellison became the first Muslim to win a seat into the Congress from Minnesota, he pledged his allegiance to the Constitution by swearing on a Quran, and the Quran that he used was Thomas Jefferson's personal Quran. In order to understand why Thomas Jefferson has a Quran, what you need to read is Thomas Jefferson's Bible. Uh, if you read Thomas Jefferson's Bible, you will find that basically, you know, he's actually <laughs> written on the side with the notes of the Bible. Thomas Jefferson edited the Bible to look more like the Quran. And I don't say this in, in jest. This is on record. Take a look at the Quran. Take a look at Jefferson's edit, editing of the Bible, and you will see the existing gap between the Bible and the Quran was reduced in what Jefferson had. Ben Franklin, on many occasions, at least three occasions, wrote what his religious creed was. He said, this is my creed. And he points to five things. And one of them is belief in God. And if you read Ben Franklin, if I show Ben Franklin's creed to any Muslim and say, this is what a man believes, what do you think of this man? They will tell you that, oh, this is a Muslim. Google it, Ben Franklin's creed. And you, it'll be interesting and educational for all of us to see. So the point that I'm trying to make is that Islam directly or indirectly was always part of, of the founding of America. So what we are doing today is not discovering Islam or Muslims, but we are rediscovering our own heritage as Americans by acknowledging Islam and Muslims. Uh, if you go to the Supreme Court, uh, there is a mural of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a lawgiver of this land. So long before Muslims were known to exist. Thomas Jeff Jefferson was asked, what, did he, what do you want on your tombstone? And he, he wanted only three things. Uh, one of them was the fact that he was the author of uh, the Declaration of Independence. The second was that he wanted to be acknowledged as the founder of University of Virginia. And the third thing that he wanted on his tombstone was the fact that he wrote the freedom, the, what is it called, De Declaration of Freedom of Religion, a statute of de religious freedom for the state of Virginia. He did not say, I want to be recognized as the third president of the United States or the first secretary of state of the United States. These are the three things he wanted. He was very proud of those three things. And I don't know whether you know this, the reason why the statute of freedom was uh, actually, it started the whole conversation in Virginia was because somebody had accidentally arrested and discriminated against Muslims. So even that was in context. So I, I actually wrote when we went to war in Iraq in 2003 that America has changed significantly. When, when America went to war against Muslims in, in, the, in the 18th century, we passed, we passed laws to protect the civil rights of Muslims in this country. 
And then when we went to war against Muslims in 2003, we passed the Patriot Act. That has nothing to do with Muslims. This is this culture of we are, we are undermining our own culture of civility. Pluralism is fundamentally important. You must understand that we cannot consider each of us as politically equal, which is what the fundamental premise of any democracy is, that we all have equal political worth. We cannot have that while simultaneously claiming that each of us does not have equal moral worth. Do you understand? If you look at somebody else as morally inferior to you, then you cannot live with them as equals in a political system. So, so it's very important that all Americans consider other Americans as morally equal to themselves, regardless of their faith or even if they are faithless. Otherwise, we will compromise the integrity. Our, our democracy will begin to fracture if we do not consider ourselves. We, and we all have. That's why the principle of human rights is so fundamentally important, because we provide rights to each other, because we are all humans. And that is where this, this culture of pluralism is important. When we say embrace pluralism, what we are trying to say is, embrace the equal moral worth of all human beings that are here, whether they are Muslims, whether they are Jews, or Hindus, or Christians, or atheists. Otherwise, our democracy will begin to crumble. And that is an important element. For Muslims, <coughs> Muslims have these in their sources where they may not have it in reality in their societies. There are at least two places in the Quran, verse 48 in chapter 5 and verse 99 in chapter 10, where the Quran says, God says, and it's actually addressing Prophet Muhammad and says, if your God wanted, if your Lord had willed, he would have made everybody on earth to believe in him. God saying, if I wanted, I would have made everybody believe in me. There's a reason why there is diversity. He says, will you then, Muhammad, try to force them to believe? Basically saying, do not force them to believe. It's not your job. And another place in the Quran, God says that I have given a law and a methodology to people of all different faiths so that they may compete with each other in doing good, not compete with each other in killing each other or proving that you are wrong and I am right. This, this is there in the Quran. Muslim scholars don't see it, don't want to talk about it, perhaps have never heard it. And that's why there is an absence of pluralism in many parts of the Muslim world. But Americans are fortunate enough to have discovered this without having received a revelation. And unfortunately, it's like saying that we have discovered the truth, we have enjoyed the truth for 200 years, now we are beginning to turn away from the truth. So I am very grateful that we have had this session. We need to have a lot more of this session. It is very important for all Americans to embrace pluralism if we are going to make America great again. Thank you.